happy we are to, to see everyone and have such a full room. We're going to get a couple of more chairs, but we were experimenting with this format because at BGC we love to use the seminar environment, so this will hopefully set a good mood. Anyway, I'm Jeff Collins, uh, the Chair of Academic Programs at Bard Graduate Center, and on behalf of the Director and all my faculty colleagues, I'm really delighted to welcome you. And I am particularly uh, thankful to the New York Silver Society for co-hosting tonight's event and, in fact, for making the whole, uh, not just this event, but the whole series possible. Um, over a glass earlier, I was hearing that the New York Silver Society and Bard Graduate Center are actually about the same age. And I was learning that you were, that, well, that you were first founded in 1991 over a lunch. And I don't actually know the, the earliest supper. Anyway, plates, plates and glasses were involved, and they still are. So that's that's yeah, great. That's here. that's what we like. And of course, we were founded in in 1994. Our official collaboration, though, uh, is only three years old, um, and this is in fact the third instantiation of um, of the. Of this lecture, when I was thinking back over the lectures that we had in the past, the first one by Ali Stilau, which was actually about silver mm -hmm. as bullion, do you remember that? Yes. And then last yes. year about yes. silver, silver designs mm -hmm. uh, by the British uh, jeweler Henry, help also, me with, yes. Henry, thank you. Um, uh, in some ways, we're returning now maybe to what you all had in mind initially, uh, <laughs> silver tableware. So in some ways, we've come back to the mainstream, and our guide to this subject tonight will be Susan Hunter. So I'm going to pass the the parole uh, to Roseanne Robb, but I just want to thank you all for making this evening possible and uh, welcome you all here. Thank you, Jeffrey and Susan. A pleasure to have the opportunity to meet you in person you. and really to have a greater understanding of what was happening before the great age of the Hong Kong and had no conversation. So I must say, I don't know if any of you have been reading all these articles that this present age of technology has eliminated face-to-face -face conversation. Is this a reminder to turn our devices off? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So I, I'm excited because I think we're in our own space and we're not trying to follow, so to speak, the crowd. And obviously, uh, the small bio, and the short bio, and the subject matter is one that is only perhaps of interest to those who are major silver decades. But I think it always opens up ideas and perhaps leads to conversations that we might not have walked into in earlier times. So here we are, back into the 17th or 18th, 18th. Yeah, century, and I'm thinking how different the world was just 200 years ago. Uh, 250 years ago, my man. Um, but it's, I think it's always good to look back in order to look forward. And I know you've all read the, the bio, uh, so I don't have to enumerate perhaps all of the places where Susan has made her mark. Uh, and she, uh, oh dear, that was bad. Uh, <laughs> I think I had one even cornier. Uh, I, I'm glad that we do have the opportunity to meet and our eyes to be open to objects that are not normally in the general public eye. And I think it's an interesting take on the Federal Reserve and its posture at that time. So perhaps I should say at this moment, my pleasure to introduce Susan. <coughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. And thanks to the New York Silver Society for sponsoring this talk. Um, I am a student here at, at uh, Bard, and I'm an, also an appraiser, and I'm a generalist appraiser. It means I go out and appraise lots of things across the spectrum. Um, and seldom do I get the chance to really focus in on one object and really um, explore the history behind it, which this, uh, this research has allowed me to do. And I think we have people in the audience who are probably are very expert in 18th century English silver, and we have others who probably don't know much about it. So hopefully I have a little something for everybody in this talk. I call this presentation a case study because I'd like to show you how research into one particular item can lead you on a winding journey of discovery. The primary purpose of my research was to try to pinpoint the date and significance 
of a silver gilt sideboard dish. But along the way, it led me down other revelatory paths. It took me to the Jewel House ledgers, which showed me who received silver from the kings and queens of England in the 17th and 18th centuries. Looking at some of the pieces supplied by the Jewel House helped me better understand the industrialization of the <coughs> silver market in the 18th century, as seen in the repetitive use of the same pattern within and between workshops. My research also brought me to my first real attempt to understand and read heraldry. <laughs> <laughs> I was reminded how the style of engraved decoration can be used to further discover the history of a piece. Mm -hmm. Finally, my research has introduced me to an interesting cast of characters who have in some way been associated with this piece of silver through its lifetime. I hope to use this dish as a case study to illustrate to you how research can take you in diverse directions and to share with you how I've begun to understand the history of this piece. The sideboard dish is in the collection of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. It measures 25 inches in diameter and weighs 150 troy ounces, so that's over two feet wide and over 10 pounds in weight. Uh, it's marked twice with the mark of the silversmith, George Garthorne, but has no other marks to indicate date or place of assay or silver standard. It's engraved with a very grand coat of arms, which I've learned is properly called a heraldic achievement. <laughs> The arms are above a pair of ribbon-tied palm fronds, and it's within a continuous band of husk decoration. The border is repoussé and chased with a band of scrolling foliage, floral vines, and harps raised on a stippled or mat ground. Mm. The decoration appears to be the emblems of Great Britain. There is the English rose on the upper left, the Scottish thistle to the right, and the Irish harp below. The fourth flower in the lower right is hard to recognize. At first you would think it would be the Welsh leek, but that's not what it looks like. Um, I think it might be a lily to indicate the French fleur-de-lis, since at this period the English monarch laid claim to the French throne, and the fleur-de-lis was part of the royal arms of Great Britain until 1801. This slide also gives you a nice close-up view of the chasing and the granular ground on the border decoration. This photograph shows you the back of the dish. It was raised from one piece of silver. There's no seam between the cavetto of the dish and the rim. And you can see how the decoration was hammered up from reverse. What else does the back show us? There's a sticker and an ink inscription that serve as the starting point of my research. The sticker helpfully suggested that the arms and crest were those of Sir Thomas Hanmer, Speaker of the House of Commons in 1714, <laughs> reign of Queen Anne. The inscription, which appears to be an ink that has oxidized, says by George Garthorne circa 1680. The upper part of the inscription, I think, is probably a dealer's inventory code, although the 15003 probably indicates the weight of 150 ounces and three penny weight. How the Federal Reserve Bank of New York had come to own this dish was not a mystery. On the display case is a brass plaque inscribed, presented by the governor and company of the Bank of England to the directors and officers of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York in remembrance of Benjamin Strong, Governor 1914-1928. Benjamin Strong Jr. was the first governor of the New York Federal Reserve Bank. He served from 1914 until his death in 1928 at the age of 55 from tuberculosis. He and the head of the Bank of England, Sir Montague Norman, had been close friends and collaborators. Strong, an avowed Anglophile, spent his summer vacations in England with Norman and according to some historians, was under the sway of the charismatic Brit. Despite the fact that Norman suffered regularly from nervous breakdowns, for which he was treated by Carl Jung. <laughs> and he is purported to have told a colleague that he could walk through walls. Some economic historians suggest that because of this close relationship, Strong's attempts to help England get back on the gold standard after World War II may have helped lay the groundwork for the Great Depression. But I am not here to talk about economic policies of the 1920s, something I know nothing about. Um, instead, we can talk about how silver was a particularly appropriate gift between two banks, 
since historically silver has been a form of currency even when made into decorative objects. Even the most elaborate silver creations, such as Louis XIV silver furniture at Versailles, have been sacrificed to the melting pot to fill the national coffer in times of need. And in England, Charles I melted down coronation regalia, as well as other silver, to fund the Civil War in 1640. The bank's choice of gift is not surprising because in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, impressive works of silver, such as trophy cups, had become the standard gift or award to give on important occasions in the professional, political, sporting, and private worlds. This gift was a sideboard dish, which is also sometimes called a rosewater dish. Here's one you may be familiar with. It's the Wimbledon tennis trophy. And this is the fellow who engraves the names of the winners on it. In the Middle Ages, a rosewater dish or basin would have been paired with a ewer for use by diners to wash their hands between courses in a period before the use of forks. Over time, the actual use of a ewer and basin faded out of fashion, and the basin grew shallower, becoming solely a display piece to be exhibited on a sideboard, and is today generally referred to as a sideboard dish. One of the most famous of these sideboard displays was created in the late 17th century by Prince Elector Friedrich III of Brandenburg, the future king of Prussia, in the Knights Hall of the Berlin Palace. Here we see an engraving of it circa 1708, and can see the nine basins with ewers in front of them. A display like this was obviously intended to exhibit the owner's great wealth, and through the use of engraved armorials, it also illustrated a family's extensive lineage. Similar displays, albeit on a smaller scale, could be found in the homes of aristocrats and landed gentry in England in the late 17th and early 18th centuries. <coughs> So this led me to wonder who Sir Tam Thomas Hanmer was to have apparently owned such a grand piece of silver. He was born in 1677 in Flintshire, Wales to an extended family of landed gentry. He was given a conservative Tory education at Christ Church, Oxford, although he did not graduate, deciding to leave in 1698 when he came into his mother's ancestral estates in Suffolk. That same year, he married very well by marrying Isabella, Countess of Arlington, and Dowager Duchess of Grafton, although it was not a happy marriage. According to the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography, quote, not only was Isabella 10 years his senior, but temperamentally they were grossly mismatched. The somewhat vulgar Duchess had been one of the Hampton Court beauties, and the refined Hanmer, although tall and handsome, was reputedly impotent. This disparity in age, intellectual attainments, and sexual experience provoked ridicule. It was said that the marriage remained unconsummated. Hanmer preserving his legendary fastidiousness, which was manifested in a fetish for wearing white gloves, <laughs> apparently even in his marital bed. <laughs> End quote. <laughs> Unfortunately, his second marriage was no better and resulted in his wife running off with his cousin. <laughs> In 1701, he succeeded his uncle to the Hanmer Baronetcy and Estates in Flintshire, Wales. The same year, he took a seat in the House of Commons and continued to serve in Parliament until 1727. He was a Hanoverian Tory who was an eloquent orator, but shied away from taking on greater responsibility in service to the crown. He seems to have been a natural politician, more or less successfully navigating his way through the intrigues of Parliament by never aligning himself too strongly with one faction, or by switching allegiances depending on the issue at hand. <clears throat> After prolonged attempts to bring him into the Queen's, Queen Anne's service, he finally agreed to be Speaker of the House of Commons in 1713, a position he held for a year until the Queen's death in 1714. The opinion in the history books seems to be that Hanmer was largely motivated by self-promotion, but did not have the will or intellect to be truly great in government. That coupled with his fastidiousness and aloofness left an impression of a contradictory character. Lord Harvey called him a sensible, impractical, honest, formal, disagreeable man. <laughs> Horace Walpole said that Hamner had died, quote, with having much obliged or disobliged any person or party and was rather pitied than either hated or beloved. So this is the man who appears to have owned this dish. The grandeur of the dish and its decoration seemed in line with his character and high self-esteem. Now I wanted to know for what occasion it was made. The first step was to try to pinpoint the date of creation 
As I have said, the, the dish has no date letter. It has the mark of George Garthorne twice on the rim among the decorative border. Hmm. As you can see, the mark on the dish to the left is GA below a coronet and above a crescent. According to Arthur Grimwade's Book of Marks, this was registered in 1697. Garthorne gained his freedom from apprenticeship in 1680, and according to Jackson's Book of Marks, his first mark was a GG with a pellet seen on the right. In 1697, silversmiths were required to register a new mark with the introduction of the Britannia Silver Standard, which incorporated the first two letters of their last name. Therefore, the inscription on the back of the dish was misleading because it said that it was made circa 1680, and in fact, it could not have been made before 1697. The absence of other marks was not that surprising for a piece of this early date. At this point, at the turn of the 18th century, assaying silver was not a matter of collecting a tax as it would become in 1720. Instead, its only purpose was to guarantee to the buying public that the silver was of the right standard. If the dish was a commission and never put on the retail market and the client trusted Garthorne that he would use the Britannia standard, perhaps they felt no need to take it to the assay office. My next step was to turn to the trusty internet and see what other silver I could find with this mark of George Garthorne. I was surprised what I found. In May of 2013, Christie's sold a nearly identical dish that had been in the collection of Al Tajir and is now with the silver dealers Koopman Rare Art in London. Both dishes have a border, repoussé with symbols of Great Britain. The Christie's dish is not marked by George Garthorne, but instead by John Beish. It is engraved with the arms of Robert, fourth Earl of Lindsay, and has the assay date mark of 1702. The Earl of Lindsay was the Lord Great Chamberlain at the coronation of Queen Anne in 1702. And for serving that role, he received two silver gilt basins and a ewer. Both Christie's and Koopman Rare Art postulate that this dish might match the ones he received from the Queen. Since it does not have the royal arms, but instead the personal arms of the Earl, it's assumed that it is not the actual one he received at the coronation, but perhaps one he had made to match. I also learned from the Christie's catalog note that there's a third nearly identical dish with the mark of George Garthorne in the collection of Burley House in Lincolnshire, England. This information sent me in search of images of the Burley House dish. I contacted the curator and he kindly sent me photographs and a description. The description said that the dish dated from circa 1690 and was engraved with the royal arms of Charles II or James II with a later cipher of AR for Queen Anne. As with the Federal Reserve Bank's dish, it is marked twice with Garthorne's mark and no other marks. The mark's the same one that the bank has that we saw was registered in 1697. Given the 1697 date, I questioned the assumption that the arms were from Charles II, who reigned from 1660 to 1685, or James II, who was 1685 to 1688. Instead, the earliest this dish could have been made was during the reign of William III. Burley House was the home of the Earls of Exeter, who had the hereditary position of Grand Almoner of England. For this role, they received silver gilt basins at the time of coronation as perquisites. One of the dishes in their collection is marked by Pierre Harash with the date mark of 1702. The cataloging with this dish says that it is engraved with the royal arms of George I or George II. From there, the catalog entry becomes a little confusing. It reads, quote, the royal arms and date of this piece would at first suggest that it is the almoner's dish presented to John, 6th Earl of Exeter, at the coronation of Queen Anne, April 22, 1702. However, the 6th Earl, of, uh, 6th Earl was chief butler and not high lord almoner at this coronation, and the dish differs from other almoner's dishes at Burley in that the relevant royal cipher is absent. The attribution of this dish as the Queen Anne Almoner's dish is further confused by the existence at Burley House of a 17th century silver gilt dish by George Garthorne, circa 1690, which is later engraved with the royal arms and cipher of AR. So it seems to me that if this dish by Harash was a coronation gift, it was the coronation at George I, and that the Garthorne dish, which matches the Banks dish, was the gift at the coronation of Queen Anne, However, the catalog states that the Earl of Exeter was not the grand almoner at the coronation of Queen Anne. So now I'm very confused. <laughs> Here I am faced with 
two dishes like the one at the Federal Reserve Bank that might have connections to the coronation of Queen Anne. Showing on top is the Garthorne dish at the Bang. Lower left is the Beige dish at Koopman Rare Art and the, with the Lindsay arms. And the Garthorne dish at Burley House with extra arms is lower right. This, of course, got me very excited by the possibility that the Hanmer dish could be a copy of a royal gift he had received. This is when I learned of the Jewel House. <laughs> Many of you, I'm sure, are knowledgeable about the, who are knowledgeable about 17th and 18th century English silver already know about the Jewel House. But for me, this was a new revelation. <clears throat> the Jewel House was a branch of the Royal Household Department that was overseen by the Lord Chamberlain. It was responsible for housing and safeguarding the crown jewels and coronation regalia, as well as supplying the royal household with silver to be used domestically and to fulfill warrants for royal gifts and perquisites. In the late 17th and early 18th century, it was located in Whitehall Palace and in the Tower of London. <clears throat> the master of the jewel house and his four members of staff kept records of all the silver that came into and left their establishment. These ledgers, dating as early as 1660, still exist and are preserved in the National Archives at Kew outside London. When doing research on silver that might have royal provenance, it's invaluable to visit the archives and examine the ledgers to see if there's an entry pertaining to the item you are researching. Therefore, if I was going to determine if Hanmer's dish was a copy of a coronation gift he had received from Queen Anne, I needed to consult the ledgers. So perhaps a little half-cocked, I happily <laughs> made plans to visit London. Uh, and this summer, I spent two days at the archives going through Jewel House records from James II through George I. Uh, there are three types of ledgers kept, at, kept, there were three types of ledgers kept by the Jewel House. The warrant books, the delivery books, and the accounts and receipt books. The warrant books have requests from the sovereign for silver to be made for various purposes. The written request is address, addressed to the master of the Jewel House and signed by the Lord Treasurer. The delivery books record when the warrants were delivered to the recipient and who signed for them. And the accounts and receipts books record the coming and going of all types of silver from the jewel house. Perusing the ledgers in search of coronation claims, it became very clear that only a small number of people received such gifts and that reign after reign, the list remains, remained basically the same. Here we see the warrant for Queen Anne's coronation in the jewel house ledger and it is similar to those before and after her. It calls for the jewel house to, just, to supply 12 canopy staves and bells for the barons of the Sank ports, a cup of gold for, gold for the Earl Marshal, a cup of gold for the Lord Mayor of London, a silver gilt bowl for the Mayor of Oxford, a silver gilt bowl for the champion, a silver gilt bowl for the chief cupbearer, two silver gilt basins and a silver gilt ewer for the Lord Great Chamberlain, and a silver gilt basin for the Lord Almoner. In the delivery books of 1702, I found the entry for the Earl of Lindsay's coronation claim on April 21st. <clears throat> this was not a great surprise because it had been cited in Christie's catalog of the Beige dish. It reads, delivered unto the right honorable, the Earl of Lindsay, Lord Great Chamberlain, as chief officer of the envoy, as his claim, two large chaste basins gilt, one chaste ewer gilt, 355 ounces, four pennyweight. What was surprising to me was that I also found the delivery of a coronation claim to the Earl of Exeter, which appears here at the bottom of the page. And it reads, delivered unto the Earl of Exeter, his claim as Lord Almoner at, his, at Her Majesty Coronation, one large chaste and gilt basin, 151 ounces. The Burley House catalog had said that the Earl of Exeter was not the Lord Almoner at the coronation of Queen Anne, but in fact he was. It seems that even at the coronation, there might have been confusion about who was Lord Almoner, since above this delivery record is one that's crossed out. And the crossed out part reads, delivered to the Bishop of Worcester, one gilt and chaste basin, his claim as chief almoner, 151 ounces. <laughs> and to the left in the margin, it says, delivered by a mistake, belonging to the Earl of Exeter. <laughs> <laughs> Burley House may also have been relying on information in the official baronage of England written by James Doyle in 1886, which says that John VI, Earl of Exeter, was the chief butler at the coronation of Queen Anne. So it goes to show you don't believe everything you read. Amen. These are the arms on the Garthorne dish at Burley House. 
In the catalog, they're identified as the arms of either uh, Charles I or James I. One, one doesn't know because the two used the same arms, but Queen Anne used the same arms up to 1706, after which she incorporated the impaled arms of England and Scotland. So given the entry in the Jewel House records and the cipher of AR, I feel that this Garthorne dish at Burley House was the coronation gift from Queen Anne. As I'd come to realize, Sir Thomas Hanmer did not hold any official position in the coronation of Queen Anne. Therefore, I was not surprised when I did not find any mention of a coronation claim going to him. But other recipients of silver from the crown are listed in the Jewel House ledgers, and I found it interesting to read. There aren't many, but the list includes the Royal Horse Guards who received silver trumpets, the Sergeants at Arms who received silver collars, and the Knights of the Garter who received their regalia. In addition, the Jewel House issued silver boxes to house the royal seal and provided christening gifts to royal godchildren. The two recipients of the largest supplies of silver were ambassadors and speakers of the House of Commons. Now, as you recall, Sir Thomas Hammer was the speaker of the House of Commons from 1713 to 1714. So even though he did not receive any gifts at the time of Queen Anne's coronation, it was interesting to read the entries pertaining to the silver he received as the speaker. And I wanna share those with you. This is the warrant from Queen Anne, dated February 24th, 1713, allowing Hanmer to borrow 4,000 ounces of silver not gilded, estimated to be worth 1,500 pounds. Silver given to officers of the state and ambassadors was called indenture plate, and it was meant to only be on loan to the individual during their service to the crown. It was almost always engraved with the royal arms and was to serve as evidence of the wealth and power of the British monarchy, particularly for ambassadors who were entertaining heads of state in other countries. According to the delivery records, Hanmer's silver was released in four batches between March 25th and July 20th, 1714. It took over a year for his order to be made. Listed here is what he ordered and received. Three dozen plates, nine covers for dishes, five dishes, two long spoons, large basin and ewer, a lot of casters, two knurled salvers, one skillet and saucepan, a chocolate pot, two ice pails, four square salts, a large cassone, I think is what it says, and two pairs of candlesticks. This all weighed in at 4,013 ounces, a little over the allotted amount of 4,000 ounces. <clears throat> By the 18th century, it had become customary for the crown to allow recipients to keep their indenture plate as payment of a job well done. On December 20th, 1714, the warrant from George I for the discharge of Hanmer's silver was recorded in the Jewel House letter, ledger. It reads in part, whereas by indenture bearing date on or about the 20th day of July, 1714, there was delivered out of the Jewel House to our trusty and well-beloved Sir Thomas Hanmer Baronet, Speaker of the House of Commons, a quantity of 4,013 ounces of white plate for the use of his table. And whereas we are graciously pleased in consideration of the good and acceptable services performed unto us by the said Sir Thomas Hanmer to bestow on him the said plate and to discharge him from the same. We actually know what Hanmer's speaker's silver looked like because in July of 2011, Christie sold the large basin or sideboard dish from this service. It has the mark of Louis Mateer and date letter of 1713. It's 27 inches in diameter and weighs a hefty 235 ounces. The scalloped rim is applied with a gadroon border and shells with foliage alternating with lambrequins, and the center is engraved with the royal arms of Queen Anne. The warrants for ambassadors and officers of state invariably say that the silver is to be made into such vessels and after such fashion as the recipient shall direct. This being the case, it seems that very few of these recipients were terribly original. In 1710, Mateer had already supplied a sideboard dish in the same pattern for Charles Whitworth for his embassy in Russia, sold with its accompanying ewer at Christie's in 2006. In 1717, he used the pattern again for the sideboard dish issued to Joseph Addison, Secretary of State in 1717, which is in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. 
And a fourth example, not gilded and without royal arms, was sold at Christie's in 2012. It's the latest of the group dating to 1720 and is engraved with the crest of Thomas Muir Esquire. I found it surprising that a private individual could order and buy silver in the same pattern as that issued by the crown through the jewel house. One would think that gifts from the crown were somehow one of a kind and protected, not available on the commercial market. But the Mateer dish belonging to Thomas Mew shows that this was not true and confirms that Hanmer's dish did not have to come through the jewel house just because it was the same pattern as what was given out at the Queen's coronation. This supports the point that Christopher Hartop puts forth in his book, The Huguenot Legacy, The Hartman Collection, that, quote, the production of silverware during the 17th and 18th century was an industrial one and that we must view the silver of the period as manufactured goods, not unique works of art, end quote. This would also go towards explaining the repetition of the same pattern among ambassadors and officers of state. Perhaps the instruction to make the silver in the fashion that the recipient requests was not really a license to create new patterns, but to choose from an existing stock of models. The fact that the Earl of Lindsay dish at Koopman Rare Art in the, is in the same pattern as the Hamner dish, but marked by beige instead of Garthorn, further illustrates the functioning of the silver industry at the time. The so-called maker's mark should more accurately be called the sponsor's mark. It's the mark of the goldsmith who actually sells the piece or takes it to assay. It may have been subcontracted out to another silversmith to have been made or purchased already finished from another workshop. There is the example of the wine cistern supplied for Lord Chesterfield's embassy in 1727. The cistern was mar has the mark of Paul de Lamry overstruck with that of Paul Crespin. Crespin had received the order from the jewel house to, su to supply the silver for Lord Chesterfield. Obviously, he got the wine cistern from Lamry and just put his mark over the top. Other pieces of the service were made in Crespin's workshop in the same pattern. So we see patterns were copied and shared between workshops. A close examination of the harp on the three dishes in question shows how similar they are and how they vary. Hmm. Two of the dishes on the upper, two of the dishes on the upper left and the bottom, incorporate laurel swags to connect the harp to the scrolls. So a laurel swag here, and a laurel swag here, which we don't have here. Um, the one that does not on the upper right also differs in the position of the ribbon. The way it unfurls is sort of a little, little different than the others. Um, it's interesting to note that the two dishes that have the same design are not both the ones marked by Garthorn. Instead, they are the Garthorn dish at the bank and the Beige dish at Koopman Rare Art. Could all three of these dishes have been made by the same hand? That's hard to determine from these photographs, but possible. And it's certainly possible despite the different maker's marks. The warrants for the coronation gifts tended to say that they should be made as they had been made before. This might go towards explaining why the Garthorn dishes seem rather old fashioned for 1702. This style of wide border of continuous high repoussé decoration shows Dutch design influence and was popular in the 1660s. It was rapidly going out of fashion by the end of the century. By 1702, a more French style was becoming fashionable, such as the Mateer dishes we just saw and the Harash dish seen earlier at Burley House with scalloped rim and applied cast decoration. This style is credited to the Huguenot silversmiths, the simple, simpler style, is credited to the Huguenot silversmiths who came to London to escape persecution in France after the revocation of the Edict of Nantes in 1685. Interestingly, George Garthorne is known to have signed a petition against the work of aliens and foreigners in 1697. So perhaps he was resistant to adopting the newest styles, which he considered foreign. The repetition of the same pattern for various important clients, the outsourcing of work to different silversmiths, and the copying of patterns made by others all help explain how these three dishes exist with, three make with different maker's marks and with royal and non-royal coats of arms. The question remained for me of when and why this dish was made for Hanmer. 
A dish of this expense and importance must have been made for a special occasion. What were the major events occurring in Hanmer's life around the turn of the 18th century? We know the dish cannot predate 1697 because of the Garthorn mark, and that it could easily have been made around 1702 because of the similar dishes given at Queen Anne's coronation. A few significant life events for Hanmer in this time frame were his inheritance of his mother's estates in 1698 and his marriage of the same year, as well as his rising to the baronetcy in 1701. This brought me to a closer inspection of the very prominent arm armorial on this dish, with hopes that it might help in pinpointing the date. The Hanmer arms, as listed in dictionaries of heraldry, consist of two azure blue lions, passant, and gardant, meaning walking and looking at you, on a silver ground. And the crest is a silver lion, gardant, sejant, meaning seated and looking at you, on a chapeau lined with ermine. Let us see if those are depicted on this dish. In the 17th century, a system was adopted in England to indicate heraldic color through the use of various engraved patterns called tinctures. We see those in use here. On the upper left corner of the shield, which is called Dexter Chief, we have two lion passant gardant engraved with horizontal lines, which indicates that the color is azure. They are on a plain ground, which indicates silver. The crest on top has a plain lion indicating silver on a chapeau with an engraved pattern rim that indicates ermine. So we do have the arms and crest of Hanmer engraved on the dish. Now, how do we identify them as specifically belonging to, to Sir Thomas? That appears to be indicated by two additional details. First of all, you'll notice a small hand in a canton on the upper left corner of the Hanmer arms. That is called the Red Hand of Ulster and is a badge to indicate that this Hanmer was a baronet, which Tom, Thomas was. Secondly, there are arms in the center of the shield with a coronet. These are the arms of Thomas Hanmer's wife, Isabella, Dowager Duchess of Grafton and Countess of Arlington. Isabella was the only child of Henry Bennett, Earl of Arlington, so when he died, she inherited the title. Since she was a peeress in her own right, she could use her father's arms and coronet. Here you see her father's arms on a book binding on the left and how they appear in the center of Thomas Hanmer's arms on the dish. When they arrived, when they married, the proper marshalling of their arms was for hers to be put in an escutcheon of pretense, which is how it is displayed here. Thomas would have had the right to display her arms on his only until her death. Now what are all these other arms? <laughs> this is called quartering. And it's a system of showing one's ancestry by displaying the arms inherited through male ancestors who married heraldic heiresses. One does not have to quarter their arms like this, but it was popular to do in the 17th century and uh, revived in the 19th century when a great deal of prestige was put on family lineage. Here are two more examples of Sir Thomas Hanmer's arms where he has chosen to quarter <coughs> differently. These are engraved book plates from 1707. These images also show you more clearly the use of tinctures, probably better than my photographs did. On the left, he has added four more quarterings, and on the right, he has simplified it to just four. In the simpler one, we see the Hamner arms uh, repeated in the lower right, and in the lower left, we have a lion surrounded by fleur, three fleur de lis, which are the arms of North, which was Thomas Hanmer's mother's family. At the beginning of the talk, I told you I came across different interesting characters in the story of this dish, and Isabella was one of them. Isabella Bennett was married at the age of five to Henry Hitzroy, the nine-year-old illegitimate son of Charles II. <laughs> <laughs> Three years later, Henry was made the du first Duke of Grafton. They had a second marriage ceremony in 1679 when she was 12 and he was 16. And they had their only child in 1683 when she was 15. The Duke of Grafton died in battle seven years later, leaving Isabella a widow at the age of 22. She was a beautiful woman and a major personality at the court of William and Mary. She was one of the eight Hampton Court beauties painted by Sir Godfrey Kneller around 1690. 
These are portraits of the most glamorous ladies of the court, and they still hang in Hampton Court Palace. She had a reputation for promiscuity. <laughs> the diarist Thomas Hearn wrote in 1714, quote, she is still living and was once a beautiful woman. Several people were supposed to have had the use of her body after the death of the Duke of Grafton before <laughs> Hanmer married her. And <clears throat> We heard earlier that Hanmer's biographer, uh, from Hanmer's biographer that Isabella and Thomas were not well matched. She was not well educated, was 10 years older than him, and much more worldly. Her private account books of 1708 to 1723 show poor handwriting and poor spelling. They show that most of her money was spent on clothes, the opera, and card playing. <laughs> She was not lucky at cards and had frequent debts owed, including an entry in May 1713 indicating that she owed her husband, owed her husband seven pounds, 10 shillings in gambling debt. <laughs> Henry Bunbury, seventh baronet, published the correspondence of Sir Thomas Hanmer in 1838, and in it he reprints her account books. And he comments that as the entries for purchases of brandy increased, so did an increase in casualties to her grace's jewels. <laughs> Now let us return to the engraving on the dish. Could this dish have been a wedding gift in 1698? If it was, then the baronet's hand would have had to have been later, because he didn't become a baronet until 1701. Could the dish have been a, to commemorate his ascendancy into the baron, baronetcy in 1701? That's a possible scenario. In the National Archives of Wales, there's a document called A Price List of Furnishings Bought by Sir Thomas Hanmer for Hanmer House, 1701-02. I've been trying to get a digital copy of this document to see if there's any silver on it, because that would be an exciting possibility that maybe he did buy this dish at that time. Um, hopefully, I'll be able to see that document soon. Beyond checking archives and reading heraldry, there's one more tool that I'd like to mention in trying to determine the date and history of a piece of silver, and that is connoisseurship. The connoisseur has the benefit of a trained eye developed over years of looking that might notice something about a piece contrary to what archives or heraldry suggest. Something has been brought to my attention recently that I feel I should have noticed myself being a student of design history. And that is the fact that the style of the engraving looks more neoclassical than Baroque. This execution of tied palm fronds is typical of the late 18th century, as is the husk motif. Here we see palm fronds from circa 1675 and ones from circa 1785. It's clear that the ones on Hanmer dish resemble the later engraving. Isabella died in 1723 without having any children with Thomas. The baronetcy became extinct upon his death in 1746. He would have only had the right to display her arms in pretense until her death, so technically the arms should not have been put on the dish after 1723. In attempt, an attempt to further decode these arms, I contacted the Heraldry Society in England, and I came upon an extremely helpful gentleman. I asked him if there was an indication that these arms were late 18th century, and he has just spent the past weekend <laughs> researching all the quarterings that appear on this dish, and he found an anomaly. The 11th quartering, which is pointed out with the arrow, in the lower right are the arms of Walden, According to Burke's peerage, Sir Thomas Hanmer had no connection to the Walden family. But around 1715, Job Hanmer, a cousin of a cousin of Sir Thomas, married Susanna Walden. In 1717, they had a son, Walden Hanmer, who after a successful career in law and in local government, received a newly created Hanmer baronetcy from George III in 1774. Aha! The style of the graving is perfect for 1774. Wanting to take another close look at the engraving, I returned to the Federal Reserve Bank of New York yesterday. <laughs> there I saw what I had first missed, and that is traces of earlier engraving that had been removed. And you can just make out in this photograph maybe wispy, very thin wispy remnants of feathery scrolls, which would have been far more appropriate for the date of the dish. So they come out on the sides, and then actually there's a little bit you can see within here too. So what does this tell us? It tells us that Walden Hanmer, first baronet, engraved this dish with his arms probably around 1775. But he included the arms of the Countess of Arlington, of which he was not entitled. 
Walden was an heir of Sir Thomas Hanmer, fourth baronet. Upon Thomas's death in 1746, the paternal side of the estates, including Hanmer House, were inherited by his cousin William. So let's say that Thomas Hanmer had originally purchased the dish in 1702 for Hanmer House and had engraved it with his arms. The dish would have passed to William Hanmer, whose estate was inherited by his brother Humphrey, who was then succeeded by Walden. So Walden inherits this dish upon Humphrey's death in 1773 and is made a baronet the following year. Perhaps he wanted to keep Sir Thomas's arms because of the high stature of this predecessor, but at the same time he wanted to quietly make them his own. It's a plausible scenario, one I hope to further investigate. So there you have the story of my journey thus far. <laughs> This dish at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York introduced me to English and American bankers of the 1920s, as well as to aristocrats and politicians of the William and Mary through George III periods. It taught me about the Jewel House and gave me a reason to personally examine the Jewel House ledgers. Through the ledgers, I came to better, better understand coronation traditions, issuance of royal plate, and the industrialization of the silver manufacture in the 18th century. The dish forced me to delve into the meaning and deciphering of heraldry. And finally, it brought me back to the concept of connoisseurship and knowledge of design history. This case study serves as a reminder that all the pieces of the research puzzle must fit together. There's more for me to learn about and from this dish, and I look forward to pursuing my research of it. Thank you. Thank you. Susan, I think I speak for all of us in saying that was masterful. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty fascinating, dude. Boy, have you found stuff since we last spoke about yeah. this well, project. Well, this past weekend. <laughs> uh, yesterday, by yesterday. the sound of it. You know, uh, I just came from a, a conversation where we were talking about the Bard Graduate Center, and one of the phrases that we use around here is learning from things. Mm -hmm. And I think you just exemplified that brilliantly. Oh, you no. learned so much from one object. So Yeah. 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 I also, Thank you. I also want to say before we open it up to questions, um, will you come back um, in a week's time to my class on approaches to the object <laughs> and give this same talk? I'd be because happy I to. think actually what you've done tonight is that you've really demonstrated um, the value, the continuing relevance of one approach to the object, which is that of the historian of decorative arts and design uh, and you know high style things. And I, I love the way you wove in all of the, the different knowledge competencies that were not your own at the beginning of the project, sure. but you realize they all add up to telling the well, story. Well, I have to say, so. it, it, it um, you know, constantly reminds me, as I said, I'm a generalist appraiser, so I know a little bit about a lot of things. And it was a con it was, this was a real reconfirmation of the value of the specialist. You know, the specialist probably would have picked that up right away. Um, I think it also reminds us there's but something But I'll very never forget. <laughs> but there's also something very special about English silver or silver in general, which is that it often carries it on itself so many helpful signs mm -hmm. that you used as ways in. Mm -hmm. And so maybe we could use that to open it up to questions, comments. So which is the Walden Arms? The one with the little blue arrow. <clears throat> so the 11th quartering, I think that is. Wings. So they are three wings. The wings? Yeah, the straight okay. one. And then three rooks, uh, ah, rooks, and then. Rooks, yeah. Oh, and, um, so that definitely would not be on the, on the fourth bandit sons. No, no, because he this family didn't marry into the family until 1715, and it was like a cousin of cousin of cousin. So in a way, he's breaking the rules. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. now, have, have any of you specialists seen this before? Stuff. Have you seen this before? He's trying to. Well, I honestly. I honestly believe and hope he can prove that he did inherit this from <coughs> Sir Thomas Hammer and somehow wanted to keep those arms. I mean, he didn't pull it out of left field. But why? What family is in the 11th quartering on the book plate? Is it maybe I, someone who wanted to discard that he chose it? <laughs> it's it's, it's, it's a little know. random to put it there. in that particular is it, spot. Is yes. it really? Yeah. Is it really? Well, could he be trying to just slip it in there, hide it? He wants it to look like Sir Thomas Hammer's, but I don't know. It's I'm hoping, you know, to get a look at that price list of 17010. Chances are there won't be anything on it, but what if there was? That'd be great. 
Also, I can look, I guess, at wills and probates of this. No, no family Um, No. And I looked at the will of Sir Thomas Hammer, and he doesn't specify. Um, How does they build it? To me, I thought it looked fine, you know. Fine to, meaning? Meaning not ten, like. Disturbed? But there is a halo around. Mm -hmm. There you can see the sort of halo up here. Yeah, but I, see it. I yeah. had been kind of told the, by someone the that that's plate not, was listed as white. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Speaker place was listed yeah. as white. <clears throat> well, the, yeah, mm -hmm. the late 18th and early 19th century loved their gilding. Exactly. Oh, yeah. but it corresponded to that time of year. Really. But what about the other two dishes by Garthorn or Garthorn and Beige? It's the same pattern in gilding. But if it was re-engraved, it would have to be re, -engraved. re -engraved. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what was I had a question for people here. Um, I can't think what it was. Are you um, aware of what prices have been in recent auction? Um, well, it, I mean, it's public record, and we are in an institute of academia. We don't usually talk about okay. this, but um, the beige dish sort of shows you sort of the unfortunate decline of the English silver market, mm -hmm. because I think at its peak, it sold for 180000 at auction, and then this last time, it sold for $68,000. Dollars? Dollars, yeah. Uh, dollars, yes. It was independent, it's it's been offered like three or four times, yeah, which didn't it help with it. It's been in the sale, and then we got them not too long before it was one of the last purchase before his death. <coughs> now, the Hanmer Speaker's Dish brought a good amount of money, 240,000 yeah. pounds. Yeah. That was a, that was that a was special thing that crushed in the market. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. Which, yeah, which in appraising, this one, I mean, I have to reconsider it now, but <laughs> uh, knowing it was fresh to the market, I didn't really compare it value-wise to this one since it had been offered so many times. It is hard to explain that Chase border at this mm -hmm. date. 1702? Yeah. Why? Do they continue to do it in three examples as late as a no. really long period? Yeah. But I like very much your point about resisting the new importation of foreign styles because honestly that's as foreign. That's foreign too. And that's just an yeah, earlier foreignness. And yeah. the Dutch didn't invent that. It's sort of Italianish. Yeah. Uh, um, it's been translated so many times that by, I suppose by that time it had been domesticated. But and it, yeah, no, I was saying for Garthorn it fell. There's nothing domestic. inherently English about it. Um, but I've read about Garthorn, people who say he worked in a Huguenot style. But this is not a Huguenot style. I thought his work is generally yeah. Okay. <coughs> Monteiths and that sort of in yeah. the traditional yeah, that side, not as you know. Yeah. yeah. They did, I had in here the But they all had the 90s in there. They had to sh wise up and sharpen up with the new influences. Yeah. And then they would start by employing perhaps workmen who were given out eventually. Yeah. So yeah. first was this. <coughs> Can we get into that? Because I, I like very much your comparison of the of the engraving of the of the harp. Um, yeah. And you know, your speculation that the same dish might have been produced, you know, by the same person. And I even wonder, is that the relevant question? You know, is it fair to assume that this dish was produced by by any one person in the system, Garthorn or mm -hmm. someone else, mm -hmm. or is it not perhaps better to see it as the collaboration of multiple specialists, one who would do the raising, one who might do the finishing, mm -hmm. and then a very specialist person, perhaps who's traveling among oh, various firms. Mm -hmm. Who's, who's doing the chasing, mm -hmm. or even were there multiple people yeah. doing the chasing? I mean, was yeah, someone doing exactly. the basic chasing and then someone coming in and doing the, the finishing chasing that would give it you know, the final sparkle? And, and so I, mm -hmm. how, how do we account for the industrial and anonymous nature of these products mm -hmm. in a subcontracting um, system where big pieces need lots and lots of special hands? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You yeah. talked about how one pattern here was done by Garthon and Bach. Mm -hmm. um, you showed the multiple versions of the dish with the um, yeah with, with the tassel, yeah. tassel yeah. cord, tassel yeah. border. So yeah. I mean that's another one that you can find being done by you know, Willow and okay. you know, four Lots or five different, different makers. Yeah. Yeah. You know, in that first decade of the century. So yeah. when you look at that, you can really see how a pa how, you know, a pattern that people like everyone jumps on board. Yeah. Here I'm really talking about the chaser. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And okay, right. Ubalda would, 
would be able to yeah. look at the chasing yes. tool used and say this is not the same tool. Oh, as interesting. That. Yeah. yeah, and I want to say on these photographs, you know, the top <laughs> two are obviously. I took the one on the left. Burley House. These are snapshots. The one on the bottom came from Koopman, and it's a you know professional photograph, so it looks almost like airbrushed. <laughs> In reality, it looks <coughs> like the others. Love to, when we were first talking about this, the, the, the question of the marking was a, a puzzle. Um, and I would love to hear the combined wisdom of the mm -hmm. audience, of the group here, in terms of your experience with this, this form of marking. My so explanation as to why there was only a maker's mark, did it, mark did it make sense? It yes, believable? it's an accepted one, a direct order to, um, <clears throat> from a client to his favorite, so his regular silversmith. No need to have the whole marks put on. The bigger and not Possibly he even, in this case, if it's big, it's different, but if it's some, something privately commissioned, he may well have supplied old silver to the mm -hmm. new fashion, which would already be known to me. Although this to had to be the big <coughs> standard. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Mm -hmm. The bigger the object, the more likely it was to have been a private commission. Mm -hmm. They were working on such small marks. <coughs> This idea about the style and the conservatism, you know, some of it's, um, there'd be two ways to go with it, wouldn't there? One would be to look at the um, function of these dishes as inherently status symbols where perhaps an aura of age and patina and ancestry, you know, is exactly desirable. So an older style might be more helpful in that context. But I wonder also if. I mean, the discussion about whether it was a new commission is, is interesting, but I mean, this is an unusual piece, but uh, you know, I don't think we can always assume that something that was purchased in a certain year was made in that right. year. I right, mean, but we know that yeah, this couldn't be early in 1697. That's right. not that much earlier than 1702, but it certainly could have been. And then well, it just got the well, we know that it was marked in 16. Is it possible that it was made earlier and was lying around until it? It has to be. That would be a great It would. It might not be. Right. That's what I'm just thinking. Maybe we'll test the metal to see what is it sterling or Britannia. Although the base is it base or bach? You said bach. I've always heard it as bach. Okay. But I. That one has a full set, full set of hallmarks. Or something too, but he could have been copying it earlier. I wasn't able to find, I sent you a couple of the ones I found in the other things, I wasn't really able to find this design any earlier to it. It's, it's slightly archaic, but it doesn't yeah. spring fully blown. The survival rate isn't great because I was looking for you know, this sort of pattern, other things like you know, toilet sets and stuff right. around the, the borders. And would that be, do you think that would be typical of the jewel house to be handing out fairly? Not old-fashioned, but they wouldn't necessarily be able to cut Yeah, but I think that's true. That's one of the things you, you get Chesterfield, yes. you know, fighting against that because there was a perception that the Jewel House was, you know, this stodgy old <laughs> well, government as entity. As I said, the the warrants for the coronation said made as they've been made before, <coughs> and whereas the indenture plate was made in the style in which it's requested. Mm -hmm. So the, the ambassadors were more up to the style, and they were asking for the new thing, but these guys were just given whatever they were given with gifts. It's interesting to look at the big dishes that are given by the congregation that is marked exactly. by the Lord Mayors mm -hmm. of London every year as the gift from the Jewish community. Mm -hmm. And they have a style that they developed in 1680 or 1681, and mm -hmm. they continue that exact same style up until the early 1720s. Mm -hmm. By which point it's, it, you know, it's in these embossed Dutch style dishes, and by the early 1720s, they were completely mm -hmm. like they must have been hard pressed to find someone who could do this mm -hmm. kind of thing mm -hmm. by that point. But it, <coughs> you know, it's a ceremonial piece, it's a very formal piece, mm -hmm. and they really have not set the style hold to it for 40 plus years. So that, that speaks to the point, you know, this, this, the silver on the sideboard of the credenza, you want mm -hmm. conservative, but your teapot you want, you know, last month, right? Because that's what people are going to critique if you're out of, out of date. Right, and having old silver on your sideboard shows you your family history. Mm -hmm. These things are inherited. And it is interesting that you know, if 
he inherited this in 1780, he didn't melt it down and have you know, a bright basket and a tea urn made out of yeah. it. Yeah. I mean, that, that's another thing I think is sort of funny with re-engraving it is choosing to re-engrave it in such a neoclassical style when it doesn't. If he's trying to do it, I mean, obviously he's not trying to do it that surreptitiously. Although it's not so far from. Yeah. From, I mean, it's it's uh, in that you answered the question because when you first showed me that, I just thought that must be 1790 arms. Mm -hmm. But and then I looked and I saw, well, no, there are 1690 arms that have the same shape and all that. But so I wonder if there isn't even in the design some. I mean, the husk, no, but yeah. the, you know, some desire to at least echo. Well, when you look at his book plate, yeah. certainly he, he, everyone was he, quartered, right. he quartered more than this. On one and it reminds book. me of pieces that are new in style, but because they were made from a piece that was melted and redone, the arms were transferred in an old style to a new piece. So it's, it's and this shield shape is a, still an earlier 18th century work shield. Or the, yeah. Did they you did he? The book plate? Yeah. Nope, nope, going the wrong way. <laughs> <laughs> so that's probably the kind of mantling he had on his, you know, on the original engraving. It's very wispy, feathery, the traces that I can see. It's the same shape of the shield. Susan, one of the great things about the Silver Society Award, which you received to give this talk, is not only, not only that funds were made available to you to facilitate your research, and you obviously made very, very good use of those. Um, but the idea is that a uh, digest or an abstract of your talk, a, a condensation of it, would be published in the, in the Silver Society Journal. And I wonder, you've presented so many avenues. What what sticks in your mind is, if you had to boil this down, what, what would be the main thread that you'd like to extract? Hmm. I don't know how long the piece can be, Roseanne, maybe you. Hmm. No, I, I think when one has quality, one would Oh, okay. We can probably solve But I guess I'm curious still to ask you, what, what of all of these stories is the one that... Well, I think learning about the Jewel House for me was a revolution. I would have come across that, I guess, eventually. <laughs> um, I mean, each thing, I mean, I think the people are interesting. It was certainly fun to get to know the people. Um, Learning about heraldry was was interesting, um, but then looking at the style, re always remembering to take step back and take that big picture and say stylistically, does this all work together? And um, you know, I, I found sort of the whole thing for me <laughs> and yeah. pretty interesting. <laughs> um, I think as far as new information to the public for people who you know knowledgeable it's just an interesting dish and uh, the people it introduces and uh, you know I talked to the archives at both banks and they claim not to have any information about how they have the Bank of England got this the archivist looked and I didn't bother to go myself been interesting I mean I uh, the speaker's plate was sold at, at Christie's um, in 1905 through an heir of uh, Hampers. But I looked at that catalog and this dish was not in that. Um, so it, you know, I, I assume the bank bought it from a dealer. I found another reference to the Hamper plate. I don't think that's something to be sold in 1907. You can't know, vintage to price list. But isn't that the same sale the speakers plate was sold? It was a whole bunch, of, like a, quite a few pieces of these plates. It was uh, okay. a different <coughs> reference than I had for other Hampers. Do you think there might have been an earlier dish, like the coronation of James II, to which that style of chasing would more, be more appropriate? You've got your emblems of British Isles, so it's sort of the right sort of thing to give out. Mm -hmm. um, and that, so, so you know, that we don't know more. such a dish. But and then actually that chasing sort of reminds me really a little bit of, of all the French stuff which disappeared in the 1670s and 80s. So 
There's still more work to do to dig back into it. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, a so, little right. interesting aside that I took out, I don't think it really is that significant, but Garthorn's applied a chandelier to Hampton Court Palace, and it has the emblems of um, the United Kingdom on too, and that's 1698. But, I mean, they're stylistically different. Than Um, and also with the Burley House, I don't know whether that's just an old catalog and they've figured it all out. I um, I emailed the curator with the information I know for that, so they know now. <laughs> we, we actually, you know, I had an adventure with Burley House because, believe it or not, there is a Philip Singh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> mm, yes. Yeah, yes. Yes. Never yes. stand there. And we have, and it matches one there. at the match. <laughs> Good question. Uh, yeah, we didn't get very far. How many you didn't get very far. Well, they, they do have <laughs> records. They, yeah, they had records, but, but similarly were, were muddled about, they wanted the name to match the life of um, some of it. It, 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 it. They didn't have it all that up. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it, they tried. They tried, and, and we, our catalog <laughs> continues to speculate to a certain to a certain degree, but we were we were able to put a few more pieces together. Yeah. It was sort of looking the family history for someone with that last name. You can see it's, 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 it's a uh, crest, or, I think it's just a crest in Hamilton. Hamilton, yeah. Which, you know, depending on which side. They were not quite getting rid of that because they thought it was of no importance. Yeah. <laughs> Say, whoops. <laughs> well, I was thinking that maybe they have other pieces in their collection that they're more important than this dish, so you didn't really care. <laughs> All right, so we've learned look at the marks, look at the heraldry, and don't leave everything you read. Don't leave everything you read. I've always thought I should do a course on heraldry at our graduate center. Maybe uh, this is a good experience. Well, yeah. What do you think? Um, it would be a learning experience for everyone. At least the basics, you know. The that would be heraldry and, and design, probably. Mm -hmm. There is a lovely book written. I think it's called Heraldry in the National Trust, um, which has lots of examples of people pushing a quarter up so it looks more important in the arms okay. and moving things around uh, in ways that shouldn't happen, but okay. because they want the families to look more important. So. And sometimes also misunderstandings between the whatever black and white thing is given to the engraver and how it gets, you know, I spent time wondering about tinctures that are wrong and I finally just decided that, you know, they weren't clearly indicated. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, four four yeah of course, four someone, four four someone four did their best and they didn't, mm -hmm. they made a mistake and we can't prove it. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Don't send a fact to China. Mm -hmm. and, and for all we know, the owner never knows the difference. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, Susan, it remains to thank you for a very rich presentation. Mm -hmm. and Sorry, we don't have any sideboard dishes waiting for us outside. We have some refreshments, so please join us there. Thanks again. Uh, no, you know, uh, they don't. And, uh, they have